Truss structure is very widely used in construction, especially in bridges and roofs. You have probably seen many truss structures in your everyday life already. In this video, we will start the discussion of simple truss analysis. The two common methods used to calculate the force in truss members, the method of joints and the method of sections, will be discussed in separate videos. Here is a picture of a model truss bridge, as you can see, built with only slender beams. Let's analyze this bridge span. It consists of a back panel and a front panel. The back and front panels are connected with floor beams, sometimes also stringers that are parallel to the panels. And on the floor, we can add a deck. And you know this is the surface that provides support to, say, for example, cars driving across the bridge. So on this deck, let's say we have an arbitrary loading, which is likely a distributed load. And because the deck is built on top of the floor beams, this distributed load is now translated onto the floor beams. And because the floor beams are connected to the joints of the back and front panels, Therefore, the loading is further translated to the joints and is further supported by the bridge piers. And that leads us to the idealization assumptions we make for truss analysis. First, we limit us to only simple truss structures, which are constructed by expanding triangles. In fact, in this video, we further limit ourselves to planar, in other words, two-dimensional truss structures. Once you've learned this, you can expand the application to space truss or three-dimensional truss structures. Secondly, as we talked about earlier, we assume all the forces are applied to the joints only. And lastly, we use a simple pin support to model the joints in the truss. The one on the left is a roller pin support, which only exerts one support force that is perpendicular to the contacting surface. And the one on the right is a fixed pin support, which exerts two support force components, one horizontal and one vertical. Because of the assumption that forces are only applied at the joints, this makes each truss member a two-force member, since forces are only applied at the two points on this member. If you recall from before about two force members, the two forces must be along the same line of action, which is simply the line connecting the two points. And the forces must also have the same magnitude and opposite direction, so there are only two possibilities. Either the two forces are applied this way or this way. On the top, the two forces pull the member, tending to elongate it, and they are known as tension or tensile force. At the bottom, the two forces push the member, tending to compress it, and they are known as compression or compressive force. Let's imagine several truss members joined together by a pin. Then if we separate them, the pin exerts forces on these members, and for convenience, let's assume there are all tensions. And of course, because of action and reaction, the truss members also exert forces on the pin and they are of the same magnitudes as the ones the pin exerts on the truss members. Therefore, if we want to know what the forces in the truss members are, we can simply solve for the forces acting on the pin instead. And this becomes a particle equilibrium problem because pins can be considered as particles. So as demonstrated earlier, if the forces in the members are tensile, then the forces acting on the pin pull away from the pin. And, on the contrary, if the forces in the members are compressive, then the forces acting on the pin push towards the pin. This is the base for the method of joints that we will discuss in another video. Remember, for planar simple truss, we apply 2D particle equilibrium to each pin. And that enables us to solve for two unknowns at one time. For a truss member under tension, if the forces acting on the two ends have magnitudes of F, what is the force inside the member? If we run an imaginary cut through the beam and separate the two segments in our mind, then due to equilibrium, 
this pair of forces must exist. Later, we will learn that this force is known as the internal normal force, in contrast with external forces. You can consider it as the force exerted by the material to the neighboring material, and you can tell these two forces are action and reaction. Since both forces are still pulling on the beam, each of the segments is still under tension. Since you can run the imaginary cut anywhere on the beam, the force developed inside the beam is the same tension force everywhere. Similarly, if the beam is under compression. You can also run an imaginary cut anywhere on the beam, and due to equilibrium requirement, the internal normal force is always compressive and is of the same magnitude F everywhere. This is the base for the method of sections that we will discuss in yet another video. Lastly, let's look at this simple truss structure. Notice at joints D and E how each of them has only two truss members connecting to it with no external loadings, and if we set up the x y axis this way at point D, and there are the two forces along the two truss members A D and C D, acting at pin D, and if we apply particle equilibrium analysis, we realize that these two forces must both be zero. Similarly. We can do a joint analysis at point E, and similarly, the forces in these two truss members C E and B E must be zero as well. So, for any joint that is connected to only two truss members that are at an angle, and if the joint is not subjected to any external force. Then these two truss members do not have any force developed in them, and they are known as zero force members. You can simplify this truss structure by removing the zero force members. Note that you can no longer simplify this structure, even though right now each joint A, B, and C is only connected to two truss members as well. These joints are also subjected to other external forces, and therefore they are not zero force members. Similarly, for this structure, if you set up the coordinate system at point B, or set it up at point D, you can also prove that in this case, both members B E and D E are also zero force members. I will leave it to you to prove that. Therefore, if a joint is connected to three truss members. The joint is not subjected to any other external force, and two of these three members are collinear. Then the third member must be zero force member as well, and can be removed from the structure in your analysis. You might wonder if these are zero force members, then why they were included in the construction in the first place? Isn't it a waste of materials? First of all, the loading situations change all the time. And secondly, don't forget in this class we currently assume no deformation in any of the objects that we study, while in reality truss members do deform, and the zero force members are needed to bear loadings. So this concludes the introduction on simple truss structures.、Um, please view the the next two videos to study the method of joints and method of sections to calculate the forces in each truss member.